the overcrowded minibus pulled up to the bus stop. It seemed like there wasn't a single empty spot inside, but Elsa knew it was an illusion. If desired, minibuses had the ability to stretch infinitely and accommodate an unreal number of passengers. Elsa was swept into the cabin by the dense human flow, forcefully pressed against someone's back. She sucked in her stomach and exhaled to take up as little space as possible. Phew, thank God. Let's go, exclaimed Elsa. Pay for the ride up front, bellowed the driver's irritated voice, echoing through the entire cabin. Easy for him to say, pay up front. One could only stand in the hands by the side's pose here. And the money was in her shoulder bag. Although, she remembered having some change in the pocket of her puffer jacket. Elsa managed to twist around and retrieve coins from her pocket. Ouch, lady, complained the auntie in front, wearing a heavy coat with overpowering sweet scents. You stepped on my foot. Sorry, mumbled Elsa, mentally adding, you're the one making it hard for me to breathe. This was the ritual quest she went through every day on her way to work and then back in the overcrowded minibus during rush hour. Elsa had gotten used to it and didn't complain. But sometimes, she desperately envied people with their own cars. Sitting comfortably in a warm cabin, listening to music, going wherever they pleased. She regretted not getting a driver's license, even though she had planned to attend driving school. Even if she had a license, she would never have enough money for a car. Still, even soberly assessing her financial situation, Elsa loved to dream. Standing in the stuffy, overcrowded minibus, feeling like a sardine in a barrel, she enthusiastically imagined that someday she would have a lot of money. Somehow, there would be a whole heap of it. Currently working as an office manager in a small company, Elsa received a modest salary. Hoping for a job change was not an option. Who would hire an employee who was always on sick leave with a child? They tolerated her at her current job only because of the dire circumstances, so Elsa dreamed of becoming rich through some completely unreal, miraculous way. Maybe she'd discover a treasure right in her backyard sandbox. Or help an old lady cross the road, and she turns out to be a billionaire who writes a will in Elsa's favor. Or perhaps she'd win the lottery. The method of acquiring money didn't matter. The main thing was how she would spend it. In her dreams, Elsa had enough for a car and an apartment, and she could buy Patrick all the toys he wanted. She wouldn't have to save and scrape by from paycheck to paycheck anymore. No more humiliation in the social fund, getting child benefits, and providing a bunch of certificates. She and Patrick could travel. Never mind going abroad, to places like Dubai or Goa. At least they could escape to the south, to the sea. Elsa hadn't been to the sea in a hundred years. She daydreamed so much that she almost missed her son's daycare. Immersed in her sweet dreams, Elsa snapped out of it only when the minibus tried to slyly pass by her stop. Oh, wait, she shouted piercingly. I'm getting off. And she began to push her way through the dense mass of human bodies. She was immediately scolded from all sides. Where are you going? Be careful, woman. Clumsy cow. Don't snap at us. Watch where you're going. Ouch, you crushed my fingers. The driver wasn't to be outdone either. You should warn in advance, he angrily yelled as Elsa finally made it to the coveted door. This is an on-demand stop. I'm not obliged to stop here. Sorry, mumbled Elsa, swallowing back tears, desperately trying to keep herself composed. She tumbled out of the stuffy, overcrowded minibus into a wet, dirty snowdrift, and the driver promptly drove away. Climbing out of the drift and feeling her thin boots instantly soaked, Elsa realized she had lost one glove, probably dropping it in the minibus while making her way to the exit. Great, nothing to say. 
Two weeks remained until the paycheck, and there were only 800 rubles left. Expenses for new gloves did not fit into Elsa's modest budget. Nevertheless, she tried to be optimistic. The weather wasn't too cold anyway, not very wintry. It had been raining for the second day, turning the white snow underfoot into a muddy mess. At a positive temperature, one could survive without gloves. Convincing herself not to get upset, Elsa briskly walked towards the daycare. Unpleasant news awaited her in Patrick's group. His throat had been hurting all evening. Concerned, Elsa placed her palm on his forehead. It didn't seem too hot. But it always started like this for him, a sore throat, followed by a cough, and then the temperature would rise. Oh God, another sick leave already? He's only been in daycare for a week. Your child is the last one left, scolded the displeased teacher. All the other children were picked up ages ago. Elsa shrugged, and what do you suggest I do? The daycare operates until 7, and I haven't been late yet. But everyone picks up their kids much earlier. I can't pick up earlier, Elsa retorted. I have a job. The teacher shook her head, as if amazed at how heartless Elsa was as a mother. Many people work, she exclaimed indignantly. But somehow, they manage. Grandmas, grandpas, aunts. We have neither grandmas nor grandpas nor aunts, Elsa replied dryly. Patrick and I are completely alone. At home, tucking her son into bed, she checked his forehead again. Indeed, it was hot. Yes, what a calamity. Slipping a thermometer under his armpit, she checked the medicine supplies. Unfortunately, everything had run out, both the fever reducer and the antiviral. She urgently needed to run to the 24-hour pharmacy. The thermometer showed 38.2. Sighing, Elsa sat down on her knees in front of the bed and affectionately asked, Patrick, my bunny, will you stay home alone for half an hour? I need to go to the pharmacy and buy you some medicine. Her son nodded lazily. Normally, he didn't like being alone at home even for a short time. But now, it seemed, he didn't care about anything. I'll be quick, Elsa promised. Putting on her down jacket, she took out her wallet and feverishly counted the cash. Nothing had changed since the morning, 200 rubles and not a kopeg more. And 600 on the card. Elsa sighed heavily. They still had to somehow make it until the paycheck. But now, there was nothing she could do. Her child's health was more important. Despite it being January, everything was melting, dripping, and flowing outside. Carefully jumping over puddles that, with their gigantic size, resembled rivers and old canals, Elsa reached the pharmacy. The medicines cost her 700 rubles. Total, 100 rubles and one and a half weeks until the paycheck. She'd have to borrow from someone, no other way. The way home passed by a small old church. Elsa didn't consider herself particularly religious, though she had been baptized. But suddenly, involuntarily, she slowed her pace and admired the domes of the small, neat church. People poured out of the church. Apparently, evening service had ended. Elsa didn't know much about it. Along the church fence, there were several beggars and homeless people, and parishioners were giving them money directly into their hats or outstretched palms. Elsa shuddered. No matter what, she thought, it was a sin to complain. She and Patrick, at least, had a roof over their heads and always had enough for bread with butter and hot soup. But these people were forced to ask for alms and shiver in the damp cold wind. Suddenly, her gaze lingered on one person in the line of beggars. It was a young man sitting in a wheelchair. His head was lowered, and his face couldn't be seen. But something familiar struck Elsa in this silhouette. She cautiously approached. The man was definitely familiar to her, 
the tilt of his head, the line of his shoulders, the thick dark curls were very reminiscent of her former boss. Suddenly, the man raised his head and met her gaze. She gasped, instantly recognizing those eyes, that nose, those lips. Nolan, she uttered in disbelief. He focused his gaze on her and skeptically said, Elsa. They had met seven years ago. Elsa had just graduated from college, and she was invited for an internship at a well-known law firm. The owners of the firm were two men, Nolan and James. They were not only partners, but also childhood friends. Both had earned a reputation as the best lawyers in the city, despite both being barely 30. Young, attractive, intelligent, and single. All former classmates and friends envied Elsa. Lucky you, they sighed. Spending the whole day around such handsome guys. Look there, don't get lost. Displeasure one of them, and you will become a lawyer's wife. However, Elsa did not like such jokes. I don't want to be a lawyer's wife, she shook her head. I want to be a renowned lawyer myself. Her classmates made a twirling motion near their temples, saying, Silly girl, where are you rushing to? The world of lawyers is made up of strong and self-confident men. It's not a woman's territory. At most, you can expect to work in some notary office and help with powers of attorney and wills. Elsa preferred not to argue, but still stuck to her opinion. She dreamed that someday she would become a true professional, just like Nolan and James. For now, she didn't mind any work, as long as it allowed her to watch how her bosses worked. It was an incomparable pleasure. By the way, the lawyers treated Elsa with respect despite her being just a recent law school graduate. Young but very determined and ambitious, Elsa had no doubts about her prospects. Externally, Nolan and James looked like absolute opposites. Nolan was a dark-haired brunette with piercing eyes and sharp cheekbones. James was a good-natured blonde with a simple but cheerful freckled face. In character, they were also complete opposites. Nolan was always serious, focused, reserved, silent if the matter didn't concern work. James was playful and cheerful, a joker, the life of the party. When he was in the office, only his voice could be heard. He immediately started showing Elsa the most explicit signs of attention, constantly complimenting how she looked or smelled. He admired her wit and efficiency. He hinted more than once that he had completely lost his head over her. Elsa joked back as much as she could in response to his advances, which became more and more intrusive every day. Well, Elsa, he would often say, winking at her. Shall we go to a restaurant after work? There's a new one that opened recently, very posh, but the food there is excellent. I'm inviting you. And then we can go to the movies or the theater, or just take a stroll. Thank you for the invitation, James, but I can't, Elsa invariably refused. Can't or don't want to, he persistently inquired. Can't and don't want to, she honestly replied. You have to separate the flies from the cutlets, relationships are relationships, and work is work. No affairs with colleagues, that's my firm belief. My principle, if you want to know. Otherwise, it will seriously interfere with my career. James, it seemed, genuinely saddened by her consistent refusals. Look at you, so principled, he sighed. Well, fine, I won't force the dear one. Perhaps, if Elsa's classmates heard these conversations, they would have considered her crazy. Refusing the sweetheart? Oh, what did she think of herself? That's why Elsa didn't tell anyone about it. In fact, by repeatedly refusing James, she was being a bit dishonest. She wasn't that principled. For example, if it were Nolan who invited her to a restaurant, she would have agreed without hesitation. 
Elsa understood that she was dreaming of the impossible, men like Nolan, unapproachable, proud, attractive, barely paid attention to gray mice like her. In fact, like all girls her age, Elsa underestimated herself. She possessed what was called natural beauty. True, she didn't strive to emphasize it in any way. She never highlighted her plump lips with bright lipstick, using colorless gloss instead. She hid her expressive gray-blue eyes behind glasses with a strict frame. She thought that in glasses, she looked more dignified, like a real lawyer. She smoothly combed her beautiful thick light hair back and tied it in a bun at the nape. At the office, she wore clothes in black, gray, and beige shades, and all the styles were strictly businesslike. It's no wonder that Nolan didn't pay her any attention as a man would to a woman. But as a professional, he highly appreciated her, and Elsa had to be content with that. In reality, of course, his praises flattered her a lot. Nolan repeatedly told her that she was doing great, that she had a bright legal future. And each time, she blushed with embarrassment, ready to fly to the seventh heaven with happiness. Sometimes Nolan acquainted her with the details of this or the criminal case he was currently working on and asked for advice, seriously, on equal terms, as if genuinely interested in the opinion of the green, inexperienced in turn. But Elsa's answers often hit the mark, and Nolan nodded approvingly. Absolutely right, Elsa, you've grasped the essence perfectly. Elsa later replayed his words in her memory for a long time, dreaming that one day Nolan would look at her differently. Not just as a boss to a subordinate. Unfortunately, her sympathy for Nolan did not go unnoticed. Scarlett also worked in the firm. She was the personal assistant to both lawyers, an impressive, bold, smart, and insightful young woman. For some reason, she immediately disliked Elsa as soon as she appeared in the office. From the very beginning of her internship at the firm, Elsa felt Scarlett's intrusive and piercing attention. The woman seemed to be waiting for Elsa to make even the slightest mistake. However, Elsa had no intention of giving her that satisfaction, and Scarlett got even more irritated by it. What have I done to her? Elsa wondered more than once. Where did I cross her path? One day, in a hurry to deliver important documents, she burst into Nolan's office without knocking and found Scarlet there. She didn't have time to see what the two of them were doing, but with her appearance, Scarlet abruptly recoiled from Nolan and stepped aside a few steps. Inside Elsa, everything literally sank at that moment. Were they hugging? Kissing? Or just talking confidentially about something? Sorry, Nolan, she stammered, embarrassed. The courier has finally brought the documents for the case. You asked to be informed immediately. Elsa. Scarlet hissed sarcastically, paling with anger. Haven't you been taught that you should knock before entering? I thought you had a higher education, and you don't even know such elementary things. Elsa turned as red as a beet, and tears welled up from embarrassment. I'm sorry, please, she barely repeated. I was just in a hurry and didn't think. Think next time. Scarlet said instructively, adjusting her elegant fitted jacket. Thinking, in general, is a useful activity, you know. Highly recommended. Well, that's enough, Scarlet. Nolan cut her off sternly. I believe Elsa has already realized her mistake and apologized. Besides, she apologized twice. And I am indeed looking forward to these papers. With a disdainful grimace, Scarlet snorted and, clacking her heels, left the office. Give me the documents, Elsa, Nolan nodded to her, and then suddenly noticed that she wasn't herself, red, upset, offended. Are you upset because of Scarlet's words? He clarified, understandingly. Stop it, please, everything is fine. I'm not upset with you. Thank you, 
Elsa mumbled shyly, sniffing and fearing that another second and she would embarrassingly burst into tears, like some schoolgirl. Approaching the chief's desk, she handed a stack of papers to Nolan. He took them, and for a fraction of a second, their fingers touched. Elsa felt like she was struck by electricity. She hastily withdrew her hand and only then realized how silly it must have looked from the outside. She glanced at Nolan from the corner of her eye and caught his reciprocating gaze, attentive and thoughtful. The blush of embarrassment once again burned her cheeks. Damn, why does this keep happening, she thought. Today, all she does is blush and embarrass herself in front of him. And again, embarrass herself and blush. But suddenly, Nolan smiled warmly at her and winked, which was entirely unexpected. Can I go? she asked uncertainly. Nolan nodded, of course, Elsa, go ahead. I won't keep you any longer. Elsa shot out of the office like a bullet, as if someone were chasing her. Racing past the surprised secretary, she rushed into the women's restroom. There, standing over the sink, she splashed handfuls of icy water on her face for a long time to calm down. To make her face finally stop burning like a red banner. A little refreshed and calmed, she was about to go back to her office and continue working when suddenly Scarlet entered the restroom. Elsa struggled to keep her composure. Proudly straightening her shoulders and lifting her chin, she was going to walk past Scarlet to the door, but a remark flew at her from behind. Are you obling, Matt? That's a mistake. Elsa didn't immediately realize that Matt was Nolan. And realizing it, she almost choked. What do you mean? She asked sharply, staring at Scarlet with a scrutinizing gaze. Well, at least don't play the naive fool in front of me. Scarlet smiled condescendingly. Maybe this trick will work on him, but not on me. I see how you drool over him. You're imagining things, mumbled Elsa, not too confidently. Scarlet tilted her head back, demonstrating her long swan-like neck, and burst into a hearty laugh, as if she had never heard anything funnier in her life. Don't flatter yourself, darling. You've been pining for him for a long time. I'm not blind. But here, your efforts are in vain. He doesn't pay attention to such as you. Elsa couldn't resist a retort. And who does he pay attention to? Such as you? Scarlet nodded regally. Why not? We're cut from the same cloth with him, know each other for a hundred years, studied together at university, our parents are friends. So why not get married? We would make a great couple. I'm a person of his circle, and you're not. Sorry, sweetheart, but it's just not your league. What? Elsa asked, puzzled. Well, if it's easier for you to understand, let me put it differently. Don't stick your pig's snout where it doesn't belong. But Elsa had already come to her senses. Apparently, the limit of humiliation for today had been reached. She squinted and said coldly, looking Scarlet in the eyes. I don't recall a switching to you. But since you insist, fine. I heard you, but remember once and for all, I decide where and with whom I stick my nose. She finished with a malicious grin. Scarlet stared at her in amazement. What do I hear? Our little room puppy has found her voice? Yes. Just don't bark too loudly, they might shut you up. I'd rather be a little room puppy than a big one. Not finishing her sentence, Elsa made a meaningful pause and noted how Scarlet widened her eyes. A big dog, she finished impassively. Then she opened the door and left the restroom, leaving Scarlet in bewilderment at this audacity. Of course, Elsa wasn't as self-assured as she wanted to appear. Nevertheless, she was proud that she didn't show Scarlet her weakness. It was nasty, of course, that Scarlet had noticed Elsa's sympathy for Nolan, but only she did. Anyway, 
she wouldn't be able to prove anything. Since then, Elsa has increasingly caught Scarlet's scrutinizing and unfriendly gaze. It made her uncomfortable. She wanted to shudder, wrap her arms around herself, shield herself from that scanning look. On the contrary, Nolan started looking at Elsa more amiably. If before he moved swiftly around the office, hardly looking at anyone, now he could easily stop by Elsa's desk and chat with her about something unrelated to work. At first, she didn't know how to react to this. She was embarrassed, shy, muttered something incoherent. But gradually, she relaxed and began to take his company more calmly. They enjoyed chatting about trivialities, unrelated to work, a new movie, a popular book, the weather. One day, Nolan suggested Elsa go out for lunch together. She was so flustered and scared that out of fear, she immediately lied that she wasn't hungry. Nolan seemed to not believe her, but still nodded and left. Idiot! Elsa said to herself in despair, Why am I such an idiot? Why didn't I go to lunch with him? Soon, Nolan returned and placed a cup of fragrant coffee and a piece of apple pie from the nearest bakery on her desk. You can't work on an empty stomach, he said seriously, but mischievous sparks danced in his eyes. Embarrassed by his attention, Elsa stammered, Thank you. How much do I owe you? Nolan mysteriously grinned, I'll take payment in a different form. And what's that? Elsa blinked nervously. Will you go to the theater with me tonight? Nolan smiled, making the offer. The theater? She asked bewilderedly. Nolan nodded, yes. A friend, the director, sent two tickets to the premiere. It should be interesting. She hesitated, not knowing how to respond. Why didn't you invite Scarlet? She finally asked. Nolan raised an eyebrow ironically, maybe because I want to go with you, not her. In Elsa's ears, Scarlet's mocking voice resounded, don't mess with your pig snout. She looked him in the eyes, all right, Nolan, I agree to keep you company. They had a wonderful time. They both enjoyed the play. After the theater, Nolan invited Elsa to dinner at a restaurant and then drove her home. Won't you invite me in for a cup of coffee? He asked with a smile. Elsa shook her head. Bring him into her rundown one-room apartment? No, she wouldn't survive such embarrassment. Another time, she nervously replied, immediately biting her tongue. On what grounds did she imagine there would be another time? What incredible self-confidence. All right, her boss nodded agreeably. However, at the moment, she didn't perceive him as her boss. There was an incredibly handsome man beside her, a man she liked to the point of trembling knees, tingling sensations throughout her body, and butterflies in her stomach. In that case, can I at least get this as a thank you for the evening? Nolan suddenly asked. And before Elsa could regain her composure, he touched her lips with a gentle and light kiss. Her head spun from his scent and taste. Elsa closed her eyes and thought that she might as well die right now, at this very moment, because it was the most beautiful thing that had ever happened to her in life. I've been dreaming of doing this for so long, Nolan said, pulling away from her a bit, his voice slightly hoarse. Elsa, you drive me crazy and looking into his eyes, which were now even darker from passion, she could only exhale happily, and you me. And so, their romance began. Elsa couldn't even dream of such a thing. Nolan took care of her tenderly and beautifully. He gave flowers, made not too expensive, but pleasant gifts, because she refused expensive ones. He invited her to concerts, plays, and interesting exhibitions. In the office, they didn't publicize their relationship and tried to behave strictly as colleagues. However, perhaps sparks between them still flickered as Scarlet's looks, which she threw at Elsa, became angrier and more malicious with each passing day. 
Did anything happen between you and Scarlet? She cautiously asked. Nolan was surprised by the question and even asked, with Scarlet? No, of course not. Why do you ask? Elsa hesitated. Well, she behaves in such a way, looks at you as if she has some right over you. Don't worry about it. Nolan laughed and waved it off. Yes, our parents once thought about marrying us, but that's nonsense. Why nonsense? I don't love her. She doesn't love me. What kind of marriage would that be? Nolan shrugged. In reality, Elsa wasn't sure that Scarlet felt absolutely nothing for Nolan. But she preferred to keep her suspicions to herself and not let her guard down. Elsa felt like Scarlet was closely watching her, waiting for any slip or mistake on her part to pounce on her. The opportunity soon presented itself. One day, Nolan and James had a very important meeting, and they strictly instructed not to let anyone in and not to connect with anyone. Elsa, I'll be away for five minutes, the secretary addressed her. Our bosses are still busy, and I want to grab a bun with coffee. I haven't had a crumb in my mouth since morning, so I'll nibble on a bun at least. Yes, of course, Mary. I'll cover for you, Elsa nodded. At that very moment, when she was alone in the reception, an unfamiliar visitor briskly entered the office. Good day, Elsa greeted her. Do you have an appointment? What time? The visitor gave her a condescending look from head to toe. She was a woman in her fifties, very stylishly dressed, well-groomed, and quite beautiful. I don't need to schedule an appointment with Nolan, she arrogantly said. I can come to him any time, day or night. She headed straight for the door, but Elsa, jumping up, awkwardly blocked her way. Excuse me, but Nolan ordered not to let anyone in. It's an important meeting now, Elsa explained. I repeat, the guest said in an icy tone through clenched teeth. I'm not just anyone. I can always go in there. I'm sorry, Elsa shook her head but you can't. At that moment, as if out of nowhere, Scarlet appeared in the reception. Seeing the invited visitor, she greeted her with a wide, sweet smile. Oh, Mrs. Smith, what a surprise. What brings you here? Yes, just dropped by to see my son and this person. The woman shot Elsa a disdainful glance. Won't let me in. Son? Elsa lost her ability to speak and blushed. How was she supposed to know it was his mother? And besides, Nolan did indeed say not to let anyone disturb him. I'm sorry, Mrs. Smith, Scarlet said innocently, reveling in Elsa's humiliation. This is just an intern, inexperienced and unprofessional. She doesn't know anything about our rules. Elsa choked with indignation and humiliation. Yes, she didn't know this woman was Nolan's mother, but that wasn't a reason to accuse her of being unprofessional. Mrs. Smith gave Elsa a disdainful, condescending look. They hire just anyone nowadays, she sighed, and then they struggle with them themselves. And she majestically entered her son's office. Well, you messed up. Scarlet shook her head, looking at Elsa and not hiding her malicious pleasure. But as it turned out, that wasn't the worst part. When Nolan decided to introduce Elsa to his parents as his future wife, Nolan's mother was shocked. What? She screamed. You want to bring this uneducated country girl into our family? Think about what you're saying, Mom. Her son scolded her. Actually, she's my girlfriend and future wife. She's an educated and smart girl. Yes, yes, I saw her education. Demonstrated a complete lack of good manners, almost kicked me out of the office. Imagine, Mom, not everyone knows you by sight. Elsa acted strictly according to my instructions. But his mother didn't give up. She's not a match for you, Nolan. 
She's nobody, without family or background. Nobody of consequence. I'll never agree to this marriage. Nolan's eyes narrowed. You're mistaken, Mom. I don't need your consent. We're not in the 19th century. Scarlet also told me she doesn't like this upstart. His mother remained adamant. Nolan shook his head. I understand that you've always dreamed of Scarlet and me getting married, but it's not going to happen. I love Elsa and only her. Well, then don't expect us at your wedding, his offended mother yelled. Your father and I will never acknowledge that commoner. Of course, Nolan relayed this conversation to Elsa, but in broad strokes, so as not to upset her too much. Nevertheless, she felt saddened. It wasn't pleasant to be so disliked. When the news spread in the office that Elsa and Nolan were planning to get married, the attitude towards Elsa immediately changed. Scarlet predictably got furious. But the most surprising thing was that James also started looking at her with hostility. What had she done to displease him? One evening, Nolan went to court, and Elsa had to get home on her own. She had already left the office, but remembered that she forgot her glasses on the table. It could wait until tomorrow, but Elsa wanted to do some more work on the computer at home, and without glasses, it was quite challenging. With a sigh, she turned abruptly and walked back. To her surprise, the lights were still on in the office. She was sure she had left last. She cautiously entered the reception area and listened. Two voices could be heard from the office, male and female. She easily recognized James and Scarlet. You don't understand, Scarlet, James said maliciously to his assistant. As long as Nolan is in his right mind, he won't give up his share to me willingly. Damn it, I'm tired of being just a partner in this firm. I want to be its full owner, the master. And now he's even marrying this country girl. Scarlet added with indignation. Elsa felt a chill realizing they were talking about her. Imagine if Nolan wants to make this fool a full-fledged partner. James continued. I won't allow it. And who's going to ask you? Scarlet smirked. No, well, as a woman, she's not bad at all, James thoughtfully added, but immediately groaned. Apparently, Scarlet nudged him or hit him. Oh, come on, come on, I'm joking. She's nothing special. Elsa couldn't listen to this anymore. Retreating, she groped for her glasses on the table and silently slipped out of the office. She walked on the sidewalk towards the bus stop, trying to digest what she had heard. It turns out James is not such a faithful friend to Nolan if he contemplates how to take over their company. Perhaps she should warn Nolan about this, but Elsa wasn't sure he would take her words seriously. After all, James might say she made it up, and Scarlet would confirm that. Then Elsa would look like a complete fool. What could she tell him? She heard only an emotionally charged conversation. What if James didn't mean you wanted to take over the company? After struggling all evening, Elsa decided not to tell Nolan. When he returned from court, she greeted him with a hot dinner and a loving kiss. It was evident he was very tired. Now was not the time for idle speculations about their partners. Elsa decided to observe James and Scarlett a bit more in the office. If she found any new information compromising them, she would definitely tell Nolan. This delay cost her dearly. On that day, Elsa caught James giving her strange look several times. She became confused, nervous, stumbled under the gaze of his eyes, and didn't understand why he was staring at her like that. Maybe he found out about her eavesdropping on their conversation with Scarlet? Unlikely. She was very cautious and didn't reveal herself. Then what? When Nolan left the office briefly, James invited Elsa into his office. Come into my office. 
Elsa rose from her seat and caught another strange look, this time from Scarlet. It made her feel completely uncomfortable. Yeah, what were those two up to? Turns out, they were up to something nasty and scary. As soon as Elsa was in the office, James deftly clamped his palm over her mouth and toppled her onto the desk, pulling up her skirt at the same time. Her eyes darkened with horror and disgust. She moaned, unable to utter a word, struggling to slip out of the iron grip. But she couldn't. It was too strong. James ripped her blouse down over her breasts and pulled down her pantyhose. Elsa realized she was going to die on this very spot from shame, disgust, and impotent anger. At that moment, the door to the office swung open, and Elsa nearly cried with relief. What a stroke of luck that James had forgotten to lock it. However, her relief was short-lived. Standing in the doorway were Nolan and Scarlet. Before Elsa could even speak to explain what had just happened, Scarlet triumphantly pointed at Elsa and declared, turning to Nolan. See, Matt, I told you she's constantly clinging to James, not giving him any space. He doesn't even know where to hide from her, poor guy. Elsa's eyes widened. What is she talking about? That's not true. She stammered, pleadingly looking at Nolan. James invited me into the office and came on to me. Nolan turned pale as a sheet. Silently, he turned toward his partner and friend, waiting for an explanation. Scarlet is right, James sighed. Sorry, Matt, but your fiancé, literally, doesn't leave me alone. She's always hanging on me. She'll press up against me, show off her cleavage, or hike up her skirt. That's not true. Elsa exclaimed, shocked. It didn't happen like that at all. Hold on, hold on, Scarlet calmly nodded. I've noticed this about her for a while. Completely unscrupulous, that redhead. She probably doesn't care who, as long as it's the boss. The main thing is to get married and start spending the husband's money. It was so monstrously unfair that Elsa couldn't find the strength to justify herself. Sobbing loudly and covering her mouth with her hands to stifle the cries, she rushed out of the office, not looking back at James, Scarlet, or even Nolan. She never returned to the office, and neither did Nolan return to the apartment. She simply couldn't bear to see him anymore, couldn't forgive that he believed them over her. How could he believe them? How could he even entertain the thought, even for a moment, that she was unfaithful? Nolan never called her again. Not that she was waiting. Although, let's not pretend, of course, she was. She hoped he would give her the chance to explain herself like a human being, that he would listen to her reasonably. But evidently, he had already made up his mind, and therefore, his love was worth nothing. The first week after the incident, Elsa spent lying on the bed, crying. She didn't answer calls from friends, didn't even go to the store, didn't eat anything. She had no appetite. Just the thought of food made her nauseous. But when the nausea became regular and mostly occurred in the mornings, Elsa stopped crying and suddenly began to consider the obvious that hadn't occurred to her immediately. She put two and two together. Compared the timelines, everything matched. Despite the circumstances, to confirm her suspicions, she forced herself to wash up, get ready, and leave the house to go to the nearest pharmacy. There, she bought several pregnancy tests to rule out any error. As it turned out, there could be no mistake. All the tests showed equally bright double lines. There was no more doubt Elsa was expecting Nolan's child. She contemplated for a long time whether she should tell him about it. Yes, they had parted on a very scandalous and ugly note, but still, he was the father, and he had the right to know. At the same time, Elsa feared that if she informed Nolan of her pregnancy, he might think that she deliberately orchestrated all of this to quickly trap him into marriage. 
or worse, he might imagine that the child wasn't his but James's. The thought terrified her. She couldn't bear such disgrace and further humiliation. She even considered writing him a letter, something along the lines of, Nolan, I'm not asking for anything, and certainly not demanding. But I won't hide from the child who his father is. If you want, you can always see him. Sitting down at the laptop, she quickly typed the necessary text and was about to click send when her gaze caught a news headline, Wedding of a Famous Moscow Lawyer. Clicking the link, Elsa opened the article and read, The well-known Moscow lawyer Nolan, considered one of the most eligible bachelors in our country, has announced his engagement. Nolan's chosen one is his longtime friend and colleague Scarlett. Elsa didn't read any further, simply couldn't. Tears immediately filled her eyes. She covered her face with her hands and sat motionless for some time, trying to compose herself. However, Nolan quickly found a replacement for her. And Scarlett, undoubtedly, was celebrating she had finally achieved her goal. Elsa couldn't remember how much time she spent like that, silent and still. Eventually, she wiped away the tears and looked at the laptop screen. With determination, she moved the cursor to the close button in the corner of the window and shut down the news portal. Then, without a moment's hesitation, she deleted the draft of her letter to Nolan, never sending it. Now that he was getting married, news of the child was certainly of no interest to him. Her son was born healthy, strong, and a beautiful boy, very much resembling his father. Just by looking into those clear brown eyes and seeing the chubby tan cheeks, Elsa understood that her son would forever remind her of her unhappy love. But she regretted nothing. And she didn't regret not having an abortion either. Without a doubt, life as a single mother was challenging, but looking at her charming little one, Elsa realized she couldn't live without him. It turned out that infants were not just a sea of endearment and tenderness. It was also dirty diapers, loads of laundry, colic, gassy moments, sleepless nights, children's illnesses, and a constant groundhog day. She stopped keeping track of days, weeks, and dates. Every day was an exact replica of the previous one. Money was desperately scarce. She took on any work-from-home gig she could find, provided legal consultations online. She had to do this during the hours when Patrick was asleep. But these earnings were not enough. Elsa planned to return to a full-time office job, but Patrick had to be placed in daycare for that. However, she had to wait. He was still too small. No daycare would take a child under one and a half years old. Certainly, her heart literally broke when she first left her little one at the daycare. How bitterly he cried, how he called for his mom. Elsa would rush away from the daycare, wiping away tears, feeling like a betrayer. Getting a job in an office turned out to be not so easy. Employers, upon learning that she had a small child, were very reluctant to invite her for an interview. And they openly made it clear that employees with children were not a priority. Elsa was rejected by one legal firm after another. Even regular notary offices were reluctant to hire a young mother, especially a single one. This meant that she would be constantly on sick leave with her child, and there was no one else to help her. In the end, Elsa managed to get a job as an office manager. Yes, it was not in her field of expertise. But given her situation, could she afford to be picky? The main thing was that they offered her a decent salary. So, Elsa's life went on. There were challenges, there were joys, there were sorrows, but there was no one more precious and beloved in her life than her Patrick. He was her joy, her little sunshine. She tried not to think about Nolan. She didn't search for information about him on the internet, didn't inquire about him. Her heart still ached from time to time, but Elsa convinced herself that gradually this too would pass. 
And now, seven years later, after their last meeting, she saw Nolan again. But in what condition? Elsa, he repeated uncertainly, stumbling over his words. What are you? What are you doing here, Nolan? She said, staring at him in disbelief. Nolan shrugged. His lips were blue from the cold, and his hair and face were wet from the still drizzling rain. What she saw was simply unbelievable, a thin, emaciated, sick person. Yet, it was Nolan. What happened to him in life? Why did fate treat him so cruelly? Oddly enough, despite Elsa having many reasons to resent Nolan and blame him for all her troubles, now, looking at him, she felt neither malicious joy nor satisfaction. All she felt was pity. What happened to you? Where's your home? Let me take you, Elsa said. Nolan shook his head. I have no home. Wait, how is that possible? What about family, a wife, a mom? Elsa asked. I have no one, Nolan stated firmly. Absolutely no one, she exclaimed. That can't be. It happens, as you can see. Absolutely no one. All right, Elsa decided, gripping the handles of his wheelchair firmly. We're going to my place, and you'll tell me everything in a calm and warm environment. Could she have acted differently? It was the only right decision in this situation, but Nolan seemed clearly disoriented. To my place, he hesitantly asked. Won't your family object? I only have a son at home, Elsa smiled. Nolan noticeably tensed. And a husband? My husband hasn't lived with us for a long time, Elsa lied, not wanting to divulge the details that she had never been married. No need for him to know that the child is his. At least, not for now. Getting to her place proved to be no easy task. The porch of Elsa's house had a wheelchair ramp, and she successfully rolled the wheelchair into the entrance. However, there was no ramp in the hallway. She halted in front of a seemingly small obstacle, just five steps to the elevator, but they appeared insurmountable to her now. I can stand and move a bit if I hold onto the handrails, Nolan awkwardly suggested. He was clearly embarrassed that Elsa had witnessed his helplessness. Great, she exclaimed. Then stay here for a moment while I lift the stroller, and then I'll help you climb as well. Done and done. Elsa dragged the wheelchair up five steps, left it on the landing, and descended behind Nolan. He held onto the handrails with one hand and Elsa with the other, carefully moving his legs. Finally, he managed to overcome this ascent. When he settled back into the wheelchair, his legs trembled from exhaustion and sweat beads appeared on his forehead. Elsa, secretly observing him, bit her lip. How did it come to pass that once a healthy, energetic, and strong man turned into a helpless invalid? At home, first and foremost, Elsa helped Nolan get to the bathroom. He needed hot water to warm up. He was already freezing near the church. She brought a clean towel and a warm terry cloth robe, showed him where the shampoo, soap, and other bath accessories were. If you want, I can help you wash she offered, but Nolan blushed. Thank you, I can manage, he replied. Yeah, don't be shy. What haven't I seen there? She couldn't resist making a joke. A faint smile touched Nolan's lips. Please bring me a stool, he asked, so that it's more comfortable to get into the bath and then climb out. Don't worry, I have strong hands, like all wheelchair users and she left him alone. While Nolan was warming up and bathing, she gave Patrick a fever reducer, sprayed throat spray into his throat. Who's this uncle? Her son whispered, listening to the sounds of running water in the bathroom. He's an old friend of mine who's in trouble. He really needs my help, so he'll stay with us for a while. You don't mind, 
Do you? Patrick nodded slowly and very seriously. I don't mind. It's hard for a woman without a man, right, Mom? For a moment, she was stunned, and then she burst into laughter and tousled his hair. What an idea you've picked up, my little philosopher. In daycare, Mrs. Davis said so, the boy explained. Mrs. Davis knows about life firsthand, Elsa sighed and hugged her son. Then she fed her son hot broth, and he quickly fell asleep. Meanwhile, the noise of water in the bathroom subsided. Elsa waited for a while for decency's sake and entered to inquire if he needed help. Nolan had already dried himself and put on a robe. Now Elsa gently took him by the elbow and led him out of the bathroom. Can you make it to the kitchen with my help? She clarified. Using a wheelchair in our narrow corridors might not be very convenient. Nolan gratefully nodded. I can, thank you. Seating him at the table, she placed a deep plate of broth in front of him, cut slices of dark bread, served a portion of macaroni with cheese, and brought out a jar of pickles. As they say, be content with what you have, she said a bit apologetically. Thank you, Elsa, Nolan said in a trembling voice. Judging by his emaciated appearance, he had been living in hunger for the past few months, and now he was immensely grateful even for simple and straightforward food. To avoid embarrassing him, Elsa turned away and went to the stove to put the kettle on. Once again, she marveled at the twists of fate. Who could have thought that the once most enviable wealthy groom in the capital, and indeed the entire country, would be sitting in her kitchen now because he had no home of his own, savoring a modest and unpretentious dinner? Placing a cup of freshly brewed tea with thyme and mint in front of him, Elsa sat down next to him and looked into Nolan's eyes intently. It was time to have a serious conversation. Tell me, what happened to you? She gently asked. Nolan smiled bitterly. Don't you see for yourself? I've become a pathetic invalid, a cripple. I no longer have a business. It was taken away. My parents died in a car accident. I'm so sorry, she sincerely said and stroked his hand. And what happened to the business? I was set up, Nolan sighed. They cunningly used and betrayed me. Elsa gasped. Who set you up? My friend and partner, James. You must remember him. Also, my wife Scarlett, who, as it turned out, was his lover at the same time. It can't be. Elsa exclaimed. Unfortunately, maybe. Although, I myself initially refused to believe it, Nolan shook his head. Word by word, he told her the whole depressing story. It turns out, James did dream of becoming the sole owner of their company, without any partners. However, it was impossible. Nolan, in his right mind, would never give up his share in the company. So, James and Scarlett came up with a cunning plan. Scarlett married Nolan, and a couple of years later, James paid a significant amount to some criminal authority. Thanks to his profession, he had many connections among the criminals. With the help of his people, the authority staged an accident, sabotaging the brakes in the car in which Nolan's parents and he himself were traveling. The driver and parents died instantly, but Nolan survived, transformed from a healthy person into a pitiful version of himself. Eventually, it turned out that all rights to the company, all my shares, now belong to James. Elsa clapped her eyes in disbelief, but how could this happen? Nolan sighed, while I was lying in the hospital, recovering from the accident, dealing with the depression from my parents' death, Scarlett constantly pushed papers for me to sign. She said it was work-related, and I... He looked away. Signed without reading, Elsa guessed. Nolan nodded, exactly. In the end, when I was discharged from the hospital, I found out that I no longer had an apartment, a company, or a wife. 
What an outrageous betrayal. Elsa shook her head. And then I remembered that episode when I caught you with James in the office, and Scarlet confirmed that you were always chasing after him. That was a lie. They set me up. Elsa exclaimed indignantly. Understood, Elsa. I understand now. Back then, I didn't even want to listen to you. If only you knew how much I blamed myself for it, how I longed for you and continued to love you. Strange love, Elsa couldn't resist a sarcastic smile. Not even a month passed after our breakup and you were already announcing your wedding with someone else. I just wanted to forget, he sighed. Thought marrying Scarlet would make me forget about you. Did it work? Elsa asked quietly. He looked her straight in the eyes and shook his head. No. She put Nolan to sleep on the couch and settled down with her son. I'll have to go to work tomorrow, Elsa said before going to sleep. Patrick is a bit sick. I won't take him to daycare, but I haven't had time to open sick leave. Would it be too much trouble for you to watch him tomorrow until evening? Of course, Elsa, he responded eagerly. I'd be happy to spend time with your son. I'll write down the medications he needs on a piece of paper, she added. It's nothing complicated. He's an independent little boy, takes pills without fuss. He eats whatever you offer him. Okay. Thank you, she exclaimed. You're helping me so much. At work, they're already looking at me disapprovingly because of constant sick leaves. It's thanks to you, Nolan said quietly. The next day at work, Elsa couldn't sit still, constantly thinking about how her men were managing at home, the big and the little one. What if Patrick gets shy and scared of the unfamiliar uncle? And she herself, leaving her son with who knows who. Not who knows who, but his father, she reminded herself. Yes, but neither Patrick nor Nolan knew about it. However, all her fears turned out to be in vain. When Elsa, out of breath and excited, opened the door with her key, she caught a delicious smell of fried potatoes. Her stomach immediately growled from hunger. She was so busy at work that she didn't even have lunch. Well, Elsa deliberately decided to skip lunch to save the last pennies until her next paycheck. Mommy's here, a smiling and happy Patrick rushed into the hallway and immediately ran to hug her. Hooray! How are you guys doing? Elsa asked, taking off her down jacket and kissed her son's cheek. Is everything okay? How do you feel? Everything is just great. Proudly declared the little son. Uncle Nolan fixed the socket in the kitchen, and he also made me a sailboat and an airplane. We even fried potatoes together, and I helped him peel them. Nolan also appeared in the hallway, rolling in on his wheelchair. He saw Elsa and smiled. You have an amazing son, he declared. I think we got along great. Not just yours, but ours, Elsa corrected him mentally, but she didn't dare say it out loud. During dinner, savoring the truly delicious potatoes, she suddenly said, Listen, Nolan, why didn't you try to fight? To sue for your company? You're a great lawyer, an experienced attorney. If you wanted to, proving James and Scarlett's guilt would be a piece of cake. I just didn't have the strength or resources for that, Nolan replied. First, my parents' death weighed me down, then my own helplessness, and then the betrayal of a friend and a wife. I thought I had no reason to fight. For what? For whom? I was left alone in the world. Does it really matter what happens to me? Whether I die by the fence or in my own bed. Elsa shook her head and gently took Nolan's hand. It does matter to me, Nolan, she said. I really want you to regain your company and see those monsters punished in court. Nolan's eyes lit up. You know, theoretically, it's possible. The chances are very high. 
but I need to do a lot of work with documents, go through a heap of old papers, archives, and I don't even have a laptop. He grinned apologetically. You can use my computer while I'm at work, Elsa generously offered. It's old, but it works fine. Gather all the necessary information. You have to restore justice, and I'll help you however I can. After all, even though I don't work in my profession, I believe that the knowledge I gained in law school hasn't completely faded from my mind. Elsa, you're a miracle. Nolan said and kissed her hand. I'll be grateful if you help me. Who knows, maybe this will work out. What about your health? Elsa asked delicately, nodding towards his wheelchair. What do the doctors predict? Will you be able to stand on your feet? Nolan darkened. I don't even know. It's 50-50. They say, in principle, everything is possible, but I need special therapeutic exercises, massage, and, of course, the desire to get better. Before, I didn't care about my condition, but now, you know, it seems like I really found a reason worth living for. Patrick had spine problems in childhood, Elsa said. Specifically to perform massages, I completed professional courses. So if you want, I can give you a massage too. I don't know if it will help, but it certainly won't make things worse. Nolan shook his head, looking at her with all his eyes. Sometimes, I feel like you're an angel sent to me from heaven. Of course, in theory, everything was much easier and faster than in practice. In reality, the process stretched out for many months. Nolan connected online with some of his former colleagues whom he could fully trust. Restoring crucial connections and securing their support, he began gathering evidence against James and Scarlett. Neither his ex-wife nor his former friend and partner suspected that Nolan was digging beneath them. Surely, they were convinced that he had long ago perished somewhere under a fence or in a homeless shelter. And Elsa found life much easier now, as Nolan took care of all the household chores. He cooked, did the laundry, and even took care of cleaning. Despite his condition, he remained quite agile. Moreover, as promised, Elsa regularly gave him massages. With each passing day, Nolan stood more confidently on his feet. He still moved along the wall, but compared to his state when Elsa met him near the church, progress was evident. Patrick, on the other hand, became attached to Uncle Nolan as he continued to call him. Sometimes Elsa felt the urge to reveal the truth to them, but each time she held herself back. Having been burned once with milk, she now blew on water. And one fine day, Nolan found out the truth himself. Elsa returned from work, completely unaware of everything. Boys, I'm home. She shouted. Hi, Mom. Patrick responded from the room, not taking his eyes off the cartoons. Nolan came out into the hallway himself, unsteadily moving his legs, but still managing on his own. Wow! Elsa exclaimed. You're making progress. Look, soon you'll start running. However, Nolan silently crossed his arms over his chest and stared at her with an assessing gaze. What happened? She asked, alarmed. Why are you looking at me like that? Today, I accidentally came across scans of my documents on the computer, he said in a steady voice. Passport, Patrick's birth certificate. Elsa chilled, understanding where he was heading. You were never married, he shook his head. There is no stamp of divorce or marriage registration in your passport. Moreover, he was born eight months after our breakup. This means you left me already pregnant. Do you want to explain anything? Elsa lowered her head. I was scared, she mumbled. Scared? Nolan angrily hit the wall with his fist. Did I not have the right to know that I would have a child? I thought you wouldn't believe me. 
that the child was yours, Elsa stammered. But I honestly wanted to tell you everything. Then I saw a news story on the internet that you were marrying Scarlet. Why didn't you tell the truth now, he asked quietly, when you brought me home, introduced me to your son as Uncle Nolan. Why did you present me as Uncle Nolan in his eyes? Elsa sighed guiltily, and Nolan squinted disapprovingly. Let me guess. You felt awkward admitting to the kid that his father is disabled? You thought he would be ashamed of me? Elsa gasped. Nolan, have you lost your mind? It's not about that at all. Then what? I'm waiting for explanations. At first, I was waiting for the right moment to tell you. But then you got caught up in the idea of reclaiming your business, and I thought that if you succeeded, Patrick and I would become unnecessary to you. What? He asked in disbelief. Well, you'll be rich and famous again, and we, we're not in your circle. Would there be a place for us in your new happy life? Well, you're a fool, Elsa. Nolan said, shaking his head. Don't you understand anything yet? What was I supposed to understand? She mumbled. That I did all this solely for you. For me? Elsa asked, not understanding. Of course. To regain, or rather, to earn back your love because mine never went anywhere. Elsa couldn't hold back her tears and threw herself into his arms. My love has always been with you. She breathed out and cried out loud. Five years later, at the anniversary of the well-known law firm, all the city's most famous lawyers gathered. It was a magnificent reception. Trained waiters brought guests glasses of chilled champagne and trays of exquisite treats. A live orchestra played, and the ladies dazzled with their evening gowns, one more beautiful than the other. Nevertheless, on that day, there was no one more beautiful than the hostess of the celebration. The wife of the firm's owner and his business partner, the beauty Elsa, attracted the attention of guests and journalists. Slim, stylish, well-groomed. She smiled dazzlingly and answered questions. Tell us, Elsa, is it true that you and Nolan once had not very successful times in your life? Of course, it's true, Elsa nodded. There was even a period when we ate plain pasta and fried potatoes because we couldn't afford meat. Journalist laughed, taking it for a successful joke, but Elsa knew that it was all true. Five years ago, they started literally from scratch. And they succeeded, they achieved what they wanted James and Scarlett faced charges. And now this couple was serving their punishment in not-so-distant places. Nolan managed to regain his company, and he immediately made Elsa his partner. Because she was the only person in the whole wide world he could trust. A month later, they finally got married. Patrick was incredibly happy about it because he had already grown attached to Uncle Nolan. Or rather, Dad. He quickly got used to calling him that and he considered him the best dad in the world. There you are. Elsa heard a voice and snapped out of the memories flooding over her. Nolan approached her, looking stunning in his new tuxedo, like a movie actor at the Oscars. You're busy with guests and journalists all evening, he teased her. Can you spare a minute for your own husband? Elsa smiled. Schedule an appointment. I have an opening next week. Oh, you. Without any hesitation under the flashes of cameras and curious eyes, Nolan kissed his wife right on the lips. People are watching, you madman. She laughed, not resisting much. By the way, Mr. Nolan, I have valuable and very important news for you. Really, Mrs. Nolan? He responded. Yes. Absolutely top secret information, Nolan. I'm all ears, Elsa. In about seven months. Yes, I believe, in about seven months, our family will grow to four. 
Nolan's eyes widened. You mean that? Yes. Elsa nodded, glowing. You'll be a dad for the second time, and I'll be a mom. Unable to contain himself any longer, Nolan hugged his wife and held her gently. A beautiful couple. Guests whispered, admiring them. And few of them could imagine the trials, treacheries, deprivations, and betrayals they had to go through to finally deserve their long-awaited and hard-fought happiness. Happiness that they would never give up to anyone ever again.